Tonight our speaker is Phil Brookman. Phil comes from the Memorial Road Church in Oklahoma City. He's been here four or five times, and the way you tell if he's good is he keeps getting invited back. And uh, he has been marvelous in the past years. He has a penchant for uh, giving an interesting twist on the truth to get you to think about it better. So tonight it's our privilege to have Phil Brookman. Good evening, church. It, it has been a, a joy on my end as well, getting to, to be with you for several years in a row now. I, I think my, my favorite part about uh, getting to share uh, a Wednesday with you uh, at least once a year has been just the, the connections that a lot of us have made before and after uh, our, our class. It, it, it's amazing how our, there's so many uh, family connections, friend connections, roommate connections between where I live in Edmond, Oklahoma, and, and this church family here. So I'm looking forward to hopefully connecting. Oh, I might have to start all that over. <laughs> well, I'm happy to be here, and I, I enjoy connecting with this church family. I really do. There's a lot of connections. I hope I can stick around and get to visit with some of you all uh, after, uh, after our services tonight. They say that every person will get 15 minutes of fame. It's kind of an old saying. You've heard that a lot. If that's true, then the corollary that I would add to that statement is that most people do not get to choose what those uh, 15 famous moments exactly are. Often they happen by accident. Earlier this year, I had a very minor about with, uh, I wouldn't even call it fame, but I received attention in the form of 26 seconds of it, and I did not plan for this. Let me explain. I was preaching a sermon in January. I was talking about the uh, luxury of technology and that luxuries uh, can sometimes become idols without us thinking about it. There's nothing wrong with, at all with technology, but but sometimes we put so much stock into it that, that, that we just, without thinking about it, we can elevate that over our relationship with the Lord. So I was giving a message about that. And in the middle of this message, I was giving an illustration and I said, we don't even have to go to the store anymore. We can just say, Alexa, order toilet paper. So I just said that in the middle of my talk. Well, I finished my sermon and then during Bible class, the Bible class hour, this man comes up to me and he says, Phil, you owe me $60. <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, my kid's sick at home. And my wife was sitting in the living room when you delivered that message. And when you said, Alexa, order toilet paper, your voice went through live stream, which is on a computer. And my Alexa, which if you don't know what an Alexa is, it's, it's this technology that can hear your voice and do what you say. So if you say, Alexa, play music. If you say, Alexa, what's 1,000 divided by 44? It, it can do math. It can do a lot of things. Well, Alexa in the living room, this man's Alexa, had heard my voice say, order toilet paper. And Alexa had ordered $60 worth of toilet paper <laughs> for this family. And so we talked about it. I'm not, not joking with you here this happened to two other families on the same day. <laughs> so by the time second service rolled around, I realized, hey, I've got a little more power than I thought I had. You know, I got the word and the spirit, but I also have the power of Alexa now. So in, in second service, I actually said, Alexa, donate $500 to Memorial Road Church of Christ, <laughs> which I was really hoping it would work. It didn't work, but... Eric Trigestad was, was sitting in the, uh, the audience. Eric Trigestad works for the Christian Chronicle. He actually just recently became the president of the Christian Chronicle, which is a news publication that goes out to Churches of Christ. Well, that day, he put this story in the form of just a paragraph or two as on the Christian Chronicle website, just as a silly thing to make, to make people laugh a little bit. This was Sunday on Monday. One or two news stations 
in other states just picked it up as, you know, just this funny story about this, you know, strange little preacher that said this. Wednesday morning, my phone just went bananas. People started texting me. Apparently, NPR, National Public Radio, had, had found this story, and for 26 seconds, my name was broadcast on National Public Radio as they talked about this story. So, I have been in ministry now for 14 years. I have preached hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lessons. I have baptized lots of people. I've led mission trips. I've helped with church plants. I've done a lot of different things in my ministry so far. But the one thing that, that people actually know about me on a more public level is toilet paper. <laughs> Which just goes to show that you might get your 15 minutes of fame, but most people don't get to choose it. It just, it just happens. Now, a legacy is very different than 15 minutes of fame because you do get to choose what your legacy is going to be. You see, legacies are not bought. Legacies are built one day at a time, one decision at a time, you have a lot of control over what your legacy is, is going to be. You can't get on Amazon and say, I'd like to buy a really good legacy. Uh, legacies happen in very small ways and they happen over time, but you do have a lot of say uh, in what your legacy will be. I, I want to give you a definition of, of legacy and then talk about it for just a few minutes. So here's one definition of legacy. A legacy is your most cherished values captured in the memory of those you love. So I, I want you to think for a moment about somebody in your life that left a legacy. Maybe it was your mom or your dad or a grandparent or, or a teacher that just really influenced your life. Well, their legacy is probably, when you think about it, it's a certain value or a certain virtue that you now remember, and you probably have stories that are tied to that virtue or that value. So, so one of uh, my heroes is my grandfather. He lived to the age of 95. He died about a year ago, and he left a legacy. One of his biggest values was loyalty. And when I think about him, I think about his loyalty in association with him fighting in World War II, serving this country. And so his legacy is a cherished value, loyalty, that now continues through me in the form of a memory. Or another great memory about, about him is he, he was a super courageous man. Like he, he never shied away from hard things. He was just really, really brave. Well, the story that lives on in my memory was the day when uh, he's... It's a longer story, but just to shorten it, he's mowing a field on a tractor in western Oklahoma, and a tornado drops out of the sky. You know, there's no early warning detection systems back then. He's running to take shelter, and he doesn't make it, and he gets caught up in the tornado and flies like Superman about 100 yards, grabs a tree, tornado passes, and he climbs down, and a few decades later, I was born. So, you think about courage, yeah. That value lives on through me in the form of a memory. That's what a legacy is. It's your value. So you think about, you know, there's a day coming when, when you won't, won't be here. But in a sense, and, and by the way, you'll be in a better place. Paul says it. We, I desire to depart with Christ, which is better by far. I think that's a really important scripture to meditate on from Philippians. Anytime that we come face to face with our own pending death or when we're face to face with the death of someone we love Paul says it's better it's better after and so when that day comes for you and when that day comes for me we will be in a better place but the people left behind will think about us and they will have memories of us and we have a lot of say over what they think about we have an opportunity to leave a great legacy and so the, the title, as I was working out with earlier this year, is 
working with Robert about what angle I would take this particular summer. What I want to spend a few minutes on is how, how do you really go about crafting a legacy that is built on being a blessing? How do you let that blessing come to you, but also flow through you to the rest of the people that, that you love? So I want to talk for a minute about blessing. I'm actually really uh, excited that you all are spending so much time this summer talking about and studying the idea of blessing. I think it's actually one of those words, and this is just my opinion, but I think it's one of those, those words that has been pushed to the edges of our theological conversations because it doesn't carry quite the weight of grace or justification or redemption. But I think blessing, I think it's pretty close to the heart of of the biblical narrative. There's a lot of depth to, to the word itself. Nowadays, we, we usually only say the word blessing when, when somebody sneezes. And, and even then, it's, if you follow, trace back the origin of that phrase, it, it, it originated when people would get the plague, and then the person knew that the other one who sneezed would probably die, and so they would say, well, bless you, as in, you know, you're not going to be here very much longer, and I hope you go to heaven. So, you know, think about that when someone sneezes. But, but blessing... Blessing is a deep word. It's a theological word, and if, if, you, if you follow it, there's actually a breadcrumb trail of blessing all the way through the Bible. Now, I want to show you at least my perception of, of how blessing functions in Scripture, and, in, and some, some other speakers might have covered a few of these things, but blessing actually starts at the very beginning of the Bible. God creates the world, he creates Adam and Eve, and if you remember at the end of Genesis chapter 1, God blessed Adam and Eve, and then said, be fruitful, increase in number. Now, I actually think this is a really, really significant point in the biblical story, because the blessing comes first. The blessing comes before the commission. So God does not say to Adam and Eve, hey, I want you to go be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth, subdue the earth. And if you do a good job, I'm going to bless you. He doesn't say that. He says, first and foremost, before they've done anything, you're already blessed because I made you. And because you're blessed, I want you to work. I want you to be fruitful. That's pretty important to remember nowadays because on my worst days... I get that backwards, and I think that I have to work really hard, and I have to do all the right things, and kind of be perfect nearly, so that God will bless me and show me his favor. I forget that I'm already blessed. Before I ever did anything, God gave his blessing to me. You can see the same order when you look at the Exodus story. If you go read the Exodus 20 at the very beginning of the Ten Commandments, it says that God brought, brought them out of Egypt first, and then he said, I want you to, to obey me. So it's interesting, the order there, the blessing, the blessing comes first, and when we as Christians realize that through Jesus Christ we're actually already blessed because of what he did on the cross, then being fruitful actually becomes a whole lot easier because we're not being fruitful in order to earn the blessing, we're being fruitful because we already have the blessing. So blessing comes first in Genesis chapter 1. But then, so I, I would say the blessing is given in Genesis 1. Then the blessing is broken in Genesis 3 and 11. So in Genesis 3, you have the first sin, Adam and Eve rebel, they eat the fruit, that they follow the words of the serpent, and all these curses come from that. that so I, in my mind, I, I see Genesis 3 as the fracturing of of humans' relationship with God. I see it as the vertical dimension fracturing. Well, Genesis 11 is the Tower of Babel, and that's where people get prideful and arrogant, and they try to build this tower, and, and God says, no, you're not going to do that, and he confuses their languages. And so humanity itself is now fragmented. People can't understand each other. I think this is the first time in the human story, or I mean a little bit before, but the first time you see it on a holistic scale that there, there's now inferiority and superiority because now people are speaking different and so there's there's this fracture and, and even if you take it to its next level and its next level I think that uh, racism and ageism and sexism and oppression they all derive 
from this fracturing of humanity on a horizontal level. So when you just read the narrative, Genesis 1 through 11, Genesis 1, the blessing is given, but then Genesis 3 through 11, the, the blessing is broken. First, between people's relationship with God, and then second, between people and people's relationship with each other. And then you get to Genesis 12, and Genesis 12 is one of the most significant chapters in the entire Bible because Genesis 12 is God's first initiative, his first plan of what, what are we going to do? Big problem. I made the world. It was good. Now it's broken. What are we going to do about it? And so here's God's plan in Genesis 12. He says, The Lord has said to Abraham, and by the way, I'm, I'm going to read through this, and I want you to pay attention to how prominent blessing is in this text. In fact, every time we get to the bolded word, bless or blessing, I'd like you to say that out loud with me. So here we go. So God says to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a... I will, those who, you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all people on earth will be through you. Well, there's a dominant theme in this. And this is the first uh, time we see God making this covenant with Abraham. In other words, what God is getting at here is he's saying, my, my blessing to the world has been fractured. It's been altered. It's been tarnished by human sin. And my plan, according to God, is to bring back the blessing in a very specific way. I'm going to call forth one group of people, starting with Abraham, and then through the generations, Abraham becomes Israel. And God says, I want to bless you, but the reason I'm blessing you is not just so you can be happy. The reason I'm blessing you is so that the entire world will know me. The entire world will actually be blessed through me because I am blessing you. As a side note, if you study the word blessing, just what it means in the Old Testament context, it usually has four implications. One is the favor of the one blessing, uh, and that would be similar to when a young man approaches his girlfriend's father and asks for his blessing in that marriage. What he's asking for is his approval, his favor. Would you declare me to be in the right so that I can marry your daughter? So one connotation of the word blessing is favor, also protection, also inheritance, and then also provision. So all, all those words are connected to the word blessing. And so God says, this is the plan. Sin has broken the world, and I'm going to bless a group of people, and then through them, the rest of the world is going to be blessed. Now, this plan is so important to God that it actually starts popping up all over the, the Bible. So before you even leave the, the book of Genesis, God repeats this in Genesis 18, 22, 26, and 28. All nations will be blessed through you. Like, this is a dominant theme. And, and people keep forgetting it, so he has to remind Isaac, and he has to remind Jacob, like, this is the plan. Israel, I'm going to bless Israel, and you're supposed to bless the world. Well, you fast forward all, many, many centuries to the New Testament, and when Peter starts explaining the gospel of Jesus, he's trying to tell the story of Jesus. He's trying to, to get through to all these Jews that don't understand how Jesus could be the Messiah. Well, Peter goes back to Genesis 12. And he says, this is what it's all about. Jesus is coming around, and Jesus is the one through which the world will actually be blessed. Jesus is doing, in one person, what Israel failed to do as, as a nation. I think it's really important not to separate Jesus from the Old Testament. Jesus was an Israelite, he was a Jew, and he fulfilled the role of Israel in one single human being. And, and that's what Peter gets at it in Acts chapter 3. And then Paul, he, gets, he, gets, he ties the whole Bible together in Galatians chapter 3 when Paul says, Scripture announced the gospel in advance. And he's going back to Genesis 12. In other words, saying that Genesis 12 is like a preview for what we see later with Jesus. And so Genesis 12 is the beginning of what we know as the gospel, the good news of how God deals with the, the sin and the fracturing of humanity that you see in the first 11 chapters of the Bible. So scripture announced the gospel in advance to Abraham, all nations will be blessed through you. So the first time, just to review, the first time we see blessing is Genesis 1, blessing is given. 
Genesis 3 and 11, uh, the blessing is broken. Starting in Genesis 12, the blessing is commissioned through Abraham. Abraham, you can do this. When you get to Jesus, what happens is the blessing is perfected. And what I mean by that is Israel, again, over and over in the Old Testament, they, they keep breaking covenant. The, and, the, and the promises, uh, if you read the end of Deuteronomy, God says it's going to happen. If you break my covenant, you're going to go to exile. Well, it happens. So Israel, who was supposed to be the primary way through which the world would be rescued, they fail. So the plan's all out of sorts. And so Jesus comes along, and then Jesus is the faithful Israelite. Jesus is the one that he fulfills Torah in himself. I mean, Jesus himself says, I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come to fulfill them. So in other words, Jesus becomes the ambassador of the blessing of God. It's a great way to think about Jesus. Jesus is the ambassador of the blessing of God. And he's bringing that to people. I mean, just think every, every person Jesus encounters... He's blessing them. In fact, uh, this is not on the screen, but look how Luke, I'm just going to read this. This is, this is the final, this, the, the, this is the final paragraph in the gospel of Luke. So Jesus dies. Jesus rises from the dead. Just before his ascension, Luke chapter 24, verse 50, uh, 50 and 51. Here's what scripture says. When Jesus had led, led them out of the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. While he was blessing them, re repeating the word, he left them and was taken up into heaven. So the very final thing that Jesus does before he leaves this earth to his disciples is to mediate the blessing one more time. The same blessing of God that came to Adam and Eve that was fractured by sin that was commissioned through Abraham, the blessing that Israel failed to give, that Jesus himself perfected, Jesus passes it on to the church. And so after he goes back into heaven in Acts chapter 1, what do the disciples do? They go out and witness to the world. So they mediate the, the, the blessing. They keep the blessing going. Even Jesus says in, in Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount, bless those who persecute you. Jesus is commissioning the church. You be the blessing. You read the book of 1 Peter. Peter says when people uh, persecute you, don't respond with a curse. Respond with a blessing. So the blessing of God, it was given at the beginning. It was broken. It was commissioned through Abraham. It was perfected in Jesus. And then the blessing has been recommissioned through the church. So we still have the mandate of Genesis 12. God will bless us, and thereby we will be a blessing to the world. So if you put all this together, here's, I'm going to give you two pictures of, of ways that, that we can think about the relationship between church, God, and the world. So here's, here's one way that many people, many churches think about God and church this way in the world. So God blesses the church, and God and the church together stand against the world. The world doesn't have our beliefs. The world is bad. The world doesn't have our morals. And so therefore, we stand with God. We are the sanctified. We are the ones who are set apart. And we don't really care what happens in the world because we are with God. So this is one way that people would, would describe, describe the story. Now, there's problems with this, namely John 3.16, for God so loved the world, so, so that there's some problems with this line of of thinking here, and one, I would say one criticism that's a valid criticism that some would levy against Christianity as a whole is that Christianity is so, um, we're so inclusive with each other and exclusive of other people that we're not really engaged with real world problems. Well, we don't care about what's really going on in the world, with whatever that might, what might be, or justice or, or just issues in society. Sometimes we sequester ourselves off from them well, that tarnishes our witness. My opinion, when I read the big biblical story of blessing from beginning to end, I think the biblical story is more like this. God is uniquely blessing the church, just like he uniquely blessed Israel. You are my, you are my people. I mean, First Peter does this. He connects the church with, with uh, Exodus 19, where 
Exodus 19 is the, the chapter before the Ten Commandments, and this is where God tells Israel, you're going to be my kingdom of priests. And I'm calling you out from the world. You're going to be pure. You're going to be holy. But then I'm sending you back into the world to mediate my presence to them. Well, then if you remember in 1 Peter, he picks up on the identical language and says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of this, the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So Jesus is saying, yes, the church is the blessed people of God. We're the sanctified people of God. We're the set-apart people of God. But we're not set apart to hoard it, as in, yay, we get the blessing of God and you don't. No, 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 this goes back to Genesis 12. God blessed Abraham so that Abraham would be a blessing. So we're not just saved to be blessed. We, we're, we're saved to be a blessing to somebody else. The blessing should come to us, but the blessing of God should come through us to reach the rest of the world. God always has in mind, from beginning to end, he wants the world to be mended. He wants the world to be whole. The sins of Genesis 3 and Genesis 11 continue to haunt the world. We're fragmented all over. Well, God's solution is Jesus comes and he shows us what it means to be a blessing. He dies for the sins of the world. And then he says, church, go do the same thing. Go mediate the blessing of God. Here's an interesting uh, story from the Old Testament I want to just share briefly, and then I want to get back to legacy. Moses, after, so Moses after golden calf, Israel sinned, they've erected the idol, very bad, 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 God is very angry. Well, Moses finds himself in an interesting position. Israel is completely sinful, they've done wrong, God knows it, Moses knows it, they know it. God's over here, and God's, God's about to punish them. And Moses stands in the middle thinking, man, I know these people sin, but I, I love them. I'm their leader. I love God. What am I supposed to do? It's a really interesting line from Moses after the golden calf. He says, so Moses went back to the Lord and said, oh, what a great sin these people have committed. So he's distressed. They've made themselves gods of gold. And this is, this is astounding what he says next. But now, please forgive their sins, but if not, then blot me out of the book you've written. And that's quite a, you talk about a legacy. In other words, Abraham is, is putting his very inheritance with God on the line, saying, take me instead, I'll die. Take, take it away from me for the sake of my people. See, I think it's really important sometimes, and I, I struggle with this too, sometimes I look at how bad and how immoral parts of our world are, and I don't ever want to say this out loud because it sounds so judgmental, but there are days when I think, well, I don't really care. If, if they just do whatever they want and they go to hell, I, I, not on me. But Moses here is flipping the script and he's saying, you know what, I actually care so much about them that I'll go to hell for them. And that's a pretty radical example of, of how he stands in the gap here and he's trying to mediate the blessing of God to this sinful people. And I think, I, I think there's something we can learn from that. Our job is not to bury our heads in the sand and just get angry and yell at the world that we don't like. Our job is to receive the blessing from God and then to mediate that to the rest of the world. Now, now let me get more narrow and focus for just a few minutes uh, towards the end here. How do we actually leave our uh, blessing as a legacy? Back to the, the original idea. We're not going to be here forever. And after we're gone, our memories will still be around. So how do we intentionally live such a life so that others will be blessed and receive a blessing from our legacy? So I'm going to give you three pretty practical things. One is this. Stay faithful in the small things. Legacies are not made in a single moment. Legacies are the culmination of a million decisions. A few weeks ago, we honored, in my congregation, couples who had been married for 50 years or longer. It was a wonderful day. And there was a lot of stories shared. And I was pretty inspired by a lot of these people who had been married such, such a long time. And the stories they shared were, were, were simple, but very profound. Stories like, my, my spouse, you know, got so 
has been so sick lately that, that they can't sleep in our bed. They have to sleep in the recliner, and so I sleep next to them in the other recliner every night just to keep them company. Well, is that a really big thing? Is that going to be written about in books? No, it's, it's, it's a relatively small story, but that's how legacies are built. Or we, we had a man pass away last year, relatively, no, yes, he was relatively young, uh, in his late 40s, died of cancer. As I prepared for that funeral, found out that the first date he ever had with his, uh, the woman he would marry, he had, they had eaten it like chilies, and then they had gone out to his car, and, and he opened his trunk, and he had this bouquet of flowers, and that was kind of his thing. So early on in their marriage, he would give her flowers. Well, he got cancer, and he got pretty weak, and the doctors eventually told him, you can't drive, you just need to rest at home, and just enjoy your final final few weeks. One day, the wife went into his room, and he wasn't there. He got pretty worried, called him, wouldn't answer his phone. About 30 minutes later, she walked outside, and his car drove up, and he got out of the car, and he pulled some flowers out of the passenger seat, and he said, honey, I just needed to do this one last time. Now, is that going to be, you know, again, written about in lots of books? Probably not. It's a relatively small thing, but that's how legacies are built. So you don't have to have the huge, big moments, but it's the little things over time. When you, when you are faithful to the small things, that people notice that. And you're, whether it's a child or a grandchild or a friend, when you are faithful to the small things, you will be remembered for those things. Paul says this in, oh, in Galatians 6, 9. He says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. I love that verse. At the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. One way to think about harvest is our own inheritance after we die, being with the Lord. But a second way to think about harvest is the influence you will have after you're gone. And so if you keep doing good and you don't give up on the little things, then after you're gone, oh, there's going to be a harvest. There's going to be a huge harvest because people are going to remember the stories of the small things. So stay faithful in the small things, but also, sh- this is important, share stories of the big things. Most people don't have dozens and dozens of dozens of just amazing, amazing stories, but most people have a few. And make sure your loved ones know those stories. And make sure you tell them, and make sure you tell them again. Because those stories, I'm telling you, those stories are the one that they change not just you, it, those are generation after generation after generation uh, kind of stories. That's how you pass on the legacy. I'll tell you one about my grandfather. He passed away a year ago. This is my favorite story about, about his life. When he was in his 30s, he was the superintendent of a school out in western Oklahoma. And one year, a, a 17-year-old boy named Hubert got kicked out of his, of his mom's house. He's a pretty troubled guy. His dad had died, and uh, his mom said, no, you're done. You can't live with me. So they had this school board meeting, and the, the question came up, what are we going to do with Hubert? And nobody volunteered to take him in, and so my grandfather said, well, it's his last year. He needs to finish school here. He can, he can finish the year with, with me in my house. And so this boy lived with my, my grandfather for one year. Well, my dad, I have, I have a dad and an aunt, and they were about... 10 and 12 years old at the time, and my dad tells me that Hubert uh, was, was pretty awful that year. He was really disrespectful. He didn't follow the family rules. He was pretty rude to my father and my aunt. And just to s- kind of stick it to my grandparents, when he graduated, he walked out the front door, walked down the street, and they never saw him again. He never said thank you one time. And so I remember my grandpa would, as a kid, he would tell me the story. Yeah, you know, I'll never forget Hubert. But he would tell me the story when I was younger more as a, you know, you need to do the right thing even if you don't know the outcome type of a story. Because he, he didn't regret it even though it was hard. And he actually, early on, he said, I, I've forgiven Hubert. He did me wrong, but I, I did the right thing. I couldn't control what Hubert did. So this was, all, this was a story in my life, growing up as a kid, I, I knew who Hubert was. I knew the story. About four years ago, black SUV 
pulls up to my grandparents' driveway. Old man steps out, walks up to the front door and knocks. My grandpa hobbles up to the front door, answers it. The man on the other side of that door said, are you Ferris Brookman? My grandpa says, yes, I am. And the man says, well, my name's Hubert. And I know it's taken me 50 years, but I needed to come back and I needed to tell you thank you. And I needed to ask you to forgive me. Man, you talk about a moment. <laughs> like my grandpa was like ultra serious, somber, reverent. And he said that he just began to weep. Here's a picture of that, of that reunion. So my grandpa's on the left. That's Hubert in the middle, and that's my grandmother on the right. 50 years. And so my grandfather said, well, Hubert, you need to know that I forgave you a really long time ago because I had decided that you might have done me wrong, but I wasn't going to let me holding a grudge against you ruin my life. So you're, you, you're forgiven. And so they walked inside, and they just sat in my grandpa's living room, and they just talked for hours. Hubert had gone to Vietnam. He had contracted Agent Orange, and he wasn't in very good health. And they had this just amazing moment. In fact, Hubert died just a few months after this event, but I'm convinced Hubert died a free man because he got this... Can you imagine how much that weighed on him for 50 years? But can you imagine the burden lifted You know, when he finally met with my grandpa? That reminds me of what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, if you're about to go off of your sacrifice and you remember that you have something wrong with your brother or sister in Christ, you leave it at the altar and you go be reconciled with your brother or sister. Like... There, there's something about reconciliation that's really important. And then my grandpa died, you know, last year, but he died a free man too because he wasn't going to let that grudge, you know, own his life. But I tell you this story to say, you talk about a legacy. Wow, I will forever be shaped by the story of forgiveness because he told it to me. Now, you might not have exactly this kind of a story, but you, you think about your, like, most important value in life, like commitment, or reverence, I, I, honor, generosity. I don't know what it is. But you take your most important value, make sure that your family knows the greatest stories of your life concerning your greatest value. Because again, that is how your legacy will be made. It's a value attached to a memory. So make sure to share those stories. Share stories of the big things. So number one, stay faithful in the small things. Number two, share stories of the big things. And I'll give you one more. Offer hope of eternal things. I, I think the greatest gift that I have been given as I've uh, been very influenced by family members, but also just by faithful brothers and sisters in Christ over the years, is, is, is when people are hopeful and faithful till the end, it's the greatest gift you can possibly give somebody else. One of, uh, we have an elder that he had to resign a few, six months ago because of health and found out a week or two ago he's on hospice and I went and saw him last week and, and he's in his chair and he's still pretty much in his right frame of mind and just, just spending 30 minutes with him was really good for me because he knows where he's going. And yeah, he, he's not thrilled about the prospect of dying, but but he's doing it with hope. And that's, that's such a legacy for me. And so make sure to offer hope of eternal things. I'll tell you two stories on that front. One is Ronald Reagan did a great job of this. He was our 40th president. 15 years ago, he lost a battle with Alzheimer's disease. He died in 2004. I want, I want to read you what his son said at his funeral. So here's what Michael Reagan said. I was so proud to be Ronald Reagan's son. What a great honor. He gave me lots of gifts as a child, a horse, a car, lots of things. But there's one gift he gave me that I think is wonderful for every father to give every son. Last Saturday, when he closed his eyes, that's when I realized the gift that he gave me, the gift that he's going to be with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I cannot think of a better gift for a father to give a son. I hope to honor my father by giving my son Cameron and my daughter Ashley the very same gift he gave me. I know where my father is. 
this very moment that he is in heaven. I can only promise my father this, Dad, when I die, I will go to heaven too, and you and my sister Marine, who went before us, will dance with the heavenly host of angels. Before the presence of God, we will do it melanoma and Alzheimer's free. What a gift to have your child stand up in your funeral and say, you know what, my dad gave me a lot of things, but the greatest thing he gave me was that I know he's with Jesus. Wow, that's a gift. That's a legacy. And I'm telling you from someone speaking on behalf of younger generations, we need that. We need people to pass with dignity and to pass with hope because we're watching. And, and how you handle your last days is how we're going to handle our last days. It's the, it's the best thing you can possibly do to leave a legacy. I'll tell you one more uh, story. Winston Churchill. He was in his right mind. I'll show a picture. Yeah. He, he was basically in his right mind up until the uh, last few days before he died. And so what happened is Winston Churchill actually got to plan a lot of his own funeral. It's one of the most interesting funerals that's ever happened. It, it was held at St. Paul's Cathedral, which is a really magnificent, elegant building in London. It's got a huge dome. I, I got to go there one time, one of those just pretty incredible buildings. Well, during the funeral, he hadn't told anybody except these people, but he had a bugler stand up at one end of the dome where the dome starts. And during the funeral, this, this bugler played taps. And if you know the song Taps, it's a sad, melancholy song. Da, da, da. They play at the end of the day uh, in the military to signify that the day is done. So it's, it's, in, it's written in minor chords. It's a very, it's a very sad song. So this bugler plays taps at the funeral, and it, it captures the heart of how everybody is feeling. Everybody is sad. Well, then there's this long pause, and unbeknownst to anybody, Churchill had asked a second bugler to stand at the opposite end of St. Paul's Cathedral, and he played Rouvet, which is a very upbeat song, and it's played at the beginning of every day in the military to signify it's a new day. And so the one thing that he wanted people to know on the day that everybody mourned his life was that there was a new day coming. And he still had hope of resurrection. I guarantee you, you talk about legacy. <laughs> Every person that was there at that funeral, can you imagine how many times they told that story to their kids and to their grandkids of this great leader who, yes, he died and that was sad, but he faced his death with dignity and he faced his death with hope because it wasn't the final chapter. Death is a doorway into the next life. And for those of us, it's, I think it's okay to be nervous and anxious about that day, but I also think it's important to remember that part of the reason that Jesus went through death before resurrection is precisely so that when we go through death, we will not be alone. He's already done it. And I think Churchill hit it on the head. He gave people hope. He offered that gift at the end of his life. So to build a legacy of blessing and to let the blessing of God, which started in the beginning of the Bible and carries all throughout Scripture, if you want that to come through you and in you and then bless everybody around you, especially as far as legacy is concerned, you stay faithful in the small things and you share the stories of the big things and then you offer hope of the eternal things. I appreciate you letting me uh, spend some time with you all tonight. Let me close us in prayer. Father, I'm so thankful for another day that you've blessed us with, a day to pause and to come together as brothers and sisters to hear the word from your holy scriptures, Father. I pray that we can receive the divine blessing from you and that we can give that blessing to other people. Father, thank you for all the men and the women who have gone before us and have served faithfully in your kingdom and Father, may their dedication to you and your truth and your love and your story and your son, may that carry on through us and live in us so that generation after generation after generation may know 
you and may have hope of life everlasting. Through the name of Jesus Christ, our living hope, we pray. Amen. Thank you again for letting me share this evening with you all. I, are, we, are we dismissed or is there something else? I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. Phil, just want to say by, on behalf of all of us here, thank you again for coming and delivering such a wonderful message, legacy of blessing, and I think we'll all benefit from that. It's wonderful to have you and your family. I know the girls went to class, and that's great to see. Uh, me personally, uh, as my family knows, I drag my feet on technology, so you make a good argument for me about that on the toilet paper side, so I appreciate it. <laughs> so, so no, but, but thank you, and all the work you're doing, and Edmund, we appreciate it. So. Let's uh, have a closing prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for today and all the wonderful blessings that we have. We're grateful that Phil has come to speak to us again this, this uh, Wednesday night, Father, and uh, he delivers such a wonderful message about the legacy of blessing. And we, Our prayer, Father, is that we can leave a good, strong Christian legacy and take the blessing that we have received out into the world. Father, be with us as we try to do that. Give us the strength to do that and to share that blessing that we've received from you. Now, Father, we want to pray for the Smith family and the passing of Joyce. We know, Father, that she has battled with this illness for a long time, and, Father, I know she is without pain now. Just be with the Smith family as they mourn the loss of Joyce. Comfort them, and may we do what we can to help in that. Be with us, Father, as we continue the rest of this week. We pray that uh, the things that we do and say will always glorify you. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.